Hi there, this is Alana. Welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I am here with Jamie Hampton. We are very glad you joined us for another Coffee Break episode. Today we are taking some of your questions that you sent us about prayer. And if you have a question of your own that you would love for us to do an episode on, we would love to do an episode on it. And you can submit your questions at prayingchristianwomen.com slash questions. So today's question comes from a listener named Joy who wants to know how to pray for older wayward children or just in general people who have fallen away from faith. I think this is going to be an awesome topic. So thank you for submitting your question, Joy. Before we jump right in to Jamie and I just sharing what's on our mind about this, let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, I just want to thank you so much for the chance to do this podcast. I thank you so much for the technology that makes it possible, for the internet connections that allows listeners to stream it, for the people who join us each week for these episodes. We just pray that they would be so encouraged. I pray for joy. I pray for the prodigals in her life. I just ask that you would give her and others in the same situation encouragement. Give us all encouragement to persevere in praying for our unsaved or wayward friends and family members, God, especially for uh, our children, the children of our listeners. We just pray that you would be calling them to walk with you um, really for, for eternity, God. That's our prayer and our hope. And I just ask that you would guide and direct our discussion. Amen. Amen. Well, how would you start this discussion there's so many things. I mean, I know you and I, Alana, have kids in the house. We don't have any children mm-hmm. outside of the home at this point. Um, but I think both of us, our oldest kids are the same age. And yeah. I just feel like we're starting to see the fact that they're their own person. And, you know, it's not going to be long before they're going to start making more choices on their own and, and thinking more, probably asking more questions and, mm-hmm. and potentially, you know, choosing different things, whether it's different theology from us or totally different faith. I mean, we, yeah. it, we're, we're at that point where we can see that. And it sounds like joy is there and, mm-hmm. in, you know, in that place where she has that longing for her kids to come back to. Yeah. It. So I think where I want to start, and again, you know, Jamie and I might not be the, the biggest experts in this because, like she said, we, our kids still are at home. They're still young enough that we could say, well, why yes, you are coming to church with us, things like that. Um, but I feel like when Christians and Christian women have discussions about prodigals, I feel like one of the things that often comes up is, what could I have done differently? And it's a pretty loaded question, and one that for most people, I would imagine, is very emotionally laden. So none of us are perfect parents, for one thing. None of us set perfect examples for our children, for another. When we go and examine our parenting lives, there are things that all of us need to confess and repent of. That being said, you can be a very good parent and a godly parent, and a praying parent, and still have a child who wanders from the faith. And I wish that weren't the case, and I wish, like, you have no idea how much I wish, (laughs) or maybe you do, that there was a magic formula. You know, if, you know, like, almost like a college savings fund, like, if you just put in this amount, and by the time they're this age, you're going to have this much. If you could pray this many hours, it's a guarantee that they're going to be walked with God. I would love to yes. just stand here and say, Me well, too. You, you just need to pray more for your kid. Wish we could say that. I don't think we can. Maybe some people are going to disagree. But like James said, our kids are our kids. And especially once they reach the age of adulthood, they do have the right to make their own choices. There will always be things that we could have done differently. But... I think we need to separate our own spiritual walk with our kids, which is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But um, I just, I want to start there and then maybe we can move into just some practical, whether it's a prodigal child or just a family member or a loved one who 
it sounds to me like Joy is asking about people who once did display at least some sort of presumed relationship with Christ, right? She's not talking about people who have always, you know, rejected the gospel and things. So what, what ways, what practical ways do we have to pray for people? Let's just call them prodigals um, in our lives. So, you know, I think of a book that I read. So there was a book that I read by Elisa Morgan. She was the former president and CEO of MOPS, the Moms of Preschoolers. And it's called um, The Beauty of Broken. And it's about her own broken family. She basically says she spent years in front of people, kind of people that probably thought that her spiritual and home life was perfect. And it was not. And she has... Um, you know, just experience with wayward children that had fallen away from the faith. Um, and she talks about not at first having the right perspective about that person you're praying for. So before you even start praying for them, not to look at their life as, or even their salvation as linear. So in her book, she says, as parents, you would like for their spiritual life to be A to Z, where A is, you know, maybe introducing the gospel for the first time or teaching them Bible stories, and you go all the way up to Z, which is them accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior and living happily ever after. And, you know, there is no linear path. Every child, every person, every adult's path is different. And so, her daughter, she's like, yeah, well, my daughter, if, if her path is, you know, A, B, C, D, E, all the way up to Q, and then she has to go to Q to the 10th power, (laughs) come back to R and then go to S and then deviate again before coming back to T, you know, um, I just thought that was a neat way to look at it because it just because they're wayward now doesn't mean that that is part of God's sovereign plan for their ultimate salvation. And that, that wayward journey, they might be gaining things that they need to get to the place of repentance and, and walking with the Lord. Um, or maybe they are believers and they've just started living this, you know, walking away from God and this is his way of bringing them back or however it works. But I just like that idea of don't assume that your child's path or that, or your person that you're praying for, that their path is going to be linear and it's going to look the same as everybody else's or, or this ideal that you have of what it should look like. Trust mm-hmm. God's sovereignty where they are right now and, and look for the ways that he's moving because, you know, she talks in her book about God will show you if you ask him, he will show you his hand moving, even if it's small things, but, but that he is at work and that your prayers are effective. Even if it doesn't mean that the day you start praying that your child comes back to the Lord. If that right. Means, yeah. I think too, it's important to preserve relationship in as much as you can. Mm-hmm. I hear some parents who almost treat it as a point of pride that, you know, yeah, we don't spend as much time with them because they don't, you know, believe what we do anymore. I feel like it's important. You're always going to be, especially if we're talking about a child, you're always going to be their parent, whether they are a confessing Christian or a Satanist or anywhere in between. They are your children and you are their parents. I feel like to the extent that you are not engaging in sinful activity with them, I think it is important to keep lines of communication open. Um, I read a really interesting book that I would recommend. It's called something like A Seat at the Table, or maybe it's called Space at the Table. So one of my novels had to do with this question of, you know, what would you do if you're a conservative Christian family and you find out that your teenage son identifies as gay? And that's not something our family has walked through. So I read quite a few different books on the subject and memoir of families who've gone through this. Space at the Table was really interesting because it's written by, I think he's a Dallas Theological Seminary professor. This is the dad. And his young adult son, who is um, openly gay, and they take turns writing in this book advice for Christian families who has a child comes out. And that's one of the things that they talk about is 
you may not agree with their lifestyle at all. You may be absolutely terrified for the eternal state of your child's soul, but it's still important to remain in their life, you know, in as much as you can. And so I would, I would say that would be another one. Um, that isn't advice on how to pray for them, but just a, a practical thing is to do what you can to just remain in their life. And even to pray, you know, for reconciliation, um, which could mean praying for their heart um, mm -hmm. to be reconciled, that they would be open to being in your life more or asking God the hard questions. Where is my heart hardened toward this child? Where am I alienating them? And things like that. If, if that's the case, it might totally not be the case, but you know, always looking inward is looking inward is always a good idea. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, I think choosing a life verse or like a scripture, maybe not a life verse, that's more like for you to ask God to give for you, but, but choosing, choosing a verse or scripture, asking God to like bring you scripture to pray over them. I just, I, I maintain that scripture is, is just one of the, how can you go wrong when you're praying scripture, you know, and it's praying God's words back. And so to maybe ask God, what is a scripture? Maybe it's a scripture that you want God, that, that God will give you that maybe it's a, a, a glimmer of hope for you that addresses his faithfulness and bringing them back. Or maybe it's something for their life specifically um, about their heart, whatever it is, but just to go into that prayerfully and ask God to reveal scripture that you can pray um, mm -hmm. and, and to just make, make little reminders all over the place to, to pray for them, set it in your phone or put it on your watch or on your mirror and just, just faithfully pray those things consistently over them. I think that's, um, that's something that could be beneficial. And, you know, I know that, um, you know, you're asking how, how to pray. And, and so, you know, as far as specifics of things that you can pray, a really cool resource that you can take advantage of addresses like this huge spectrum of 30 different ways that you can pray for the unsaved people in your life. And some of them do specifically deal with wayward children or that have not wayward people that have not come back to the faith and um, but they're applicable to anyone that you know that's unsaved and it's um, 30 days of prayer for the unsaved and if you want to go and we're going to read one of those prayers today actually in in each of our coffee break episodes um, but if you go to prayingchristianwomen.com slash unsaved you can actually sign up to get one prayer each day for 30 days delivered to your inbox and that could be just an automatic prompting to pray for your child or your wayward friend um, Mm -hmm. You know, and there is a theological debate that we're absolutely not about to touch, and that's, you know, the question of, is a prodigal, like, you know, can you be a Christian and then all of a sudden not be a Christian? Like, at one point in your life, can you be heaven bound, and at the next point not be? That's not what we're talking about, but I feel like praying for prodigals, it's going to be very similar to praying for the unsaved from whichever side of the theology aisle or, you know, anywhere in between or undecided you are. I feel like, yeah, you, you pray for them in the same way that you would pray for the unsaved. One of the neat tools, I, I don't even want to call it a tool, but um, for lack of a better word, one of the neat tools you can use is just praying with your imagination. And so, you know, as you're praying, picture this person and what they would look like or be like, or what would they be doing if they were seen? How would that look? And it's not like a way that you're going to conjure up the future. It's just a way, in my mind, you're kind of encouraging yourself to pray. You're sort of being like your own prayer coach, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, so picture things specifically. It might not look exactly like that, but it, to me, it can add a lot of just emotional intensity to prayer. And the goal of prayer is not to achieve a state of emotional intensity, but I feel like it does help you stay motivated and encouraged and really engaged with the Chris. Because especially if we're talking about praying for prodigals, this can be a decades long process. And so I feel like anything that you can do that can help you kind of fight monotony or discouragements can be really helpful. 
Right. And when we've discussed this before, you've mentioned that it's not like using your imagination that you're trying to bend God or that you feel like mm -hmm. if something comes to your mind that God is giving you a promise. And I think that needs to be addressed too is, you know, when I talked about asking God for a verse or a scripture or if you, you know, God, give me a picture of what my child might look mm -hmm. like if they were, um, if they'd come back to you, um, is to just be very careful not to assume that what you're given is is a promise from God For sure. to rest in his promise that he is faithful and that prayer is powerful. But, um, but for instance, if, if God says, you know, I'm, I'm faithful that none would be lost and, and you pray that and you don't see those results immediately um, or you feel like God is showing you a picture of your child free from addiction and that doesn't happen at, um, mm -hmm. I just feel like to, to recognize that we're praying for hopes, we're not praying to bend God's will, but we're praying, um, in alignment with, with his yeah. desires for his kids. Um, I, I don't know if I explained that very well. Well, you know, I've got a, a personal story that kind of ties along with that. So okay. I was, I just graduated college and I was at a Christian one of those Christian concerts, you know, like those two or three day things where you camp out there and stuff. So you're at one of these, is that one of these worship, um, might have even been Jeremy Camp, I forget who it was. It was, you know, like a, a worship set, good music. And there had been someone in my life who was a prodigal that I had been praying for. And I heard very specifically, this person's gonna be saved in five years. And I'm like, oh, hallelujah, I wrote it down. I put it in my Bible, I put the date, and it was in five years this person going to be saved, they're going to be living for the Lord. As far as I know, that never happens. <clears throat> okay, so unless there was some kind of very silent thing <laughs> that didn't produce much fruit, I was wrong. <laughs> you know, so on the one hand, I could get mad at God and say, well, God, you promised me this person's going to be saved by this time. I could be like, oh, rats, God wanted me to pray and I didn't pray hard enough or I didn't witness hard enough. I failed God. Or kind of where I'm at, it was just like, huh, wonder what happened. <laughs> but I don't regret that I prayed fervently with expectation that this person would be saved. Because I feel like even though I'm pretty definite I got the timeline wrong, I still feel like my prayers made a difference, you know? Yeah. So just holding those, holding those things with open hands and, you know, praying boldly with expectation. Um, but looking for, you know, any movement is God's movement. I really believe that. And, you know, when I, any time that, that my husband and I have gone through tough times or upheaval, I'm just like, well, at least God is moving. I know that much, you know, <laughs> and it, he's moving. And I just think of it as like shifting tectonic plates, you know, it causes a rumble and a ruckus and sometimes some destruction and casualties, you know, but God is moving. And so even when, the child that you're praying for faithfully seems to be going downhill instead of uphill. We just, we don't know what God is doing, but he is moving. Things aren't staying the same. And you can guarantee that in all things, he is at work for those that love him and are called according Absolutely. to his purpose. And so you can just know that not to give up, even when things don't turn out the way you think, or even the way that you think you heard from God, they would turn out um, right. just to be consistent and and well, and let's be um, absolutely brutally honest, sometimes prodigals die, and either we're left wondering, or our unsaved friends die, we're left wondering, okay, what's that mean for them? Like, I feel like you could probably literally drive yourself crazy if you dwelt on that for too long, and so when things like that happen in my life, it's, it's kind of a, well, at least they knew, you know what I mean? And you never know what happens in someone's heart and spirit. The moments before death and so if somebody that you love died and you don't know for sure that you're going to see them in heaven i would say one you could use that as a motivation to just make sure that you're continuing to pray and share the gospel with people that still are in your life but also to not get so much in despair because you don't know what could have happened in those last moments and then one more thing I wanted to talk about. I feel like we've been recommending a lot of different books in this episode. There's one you mentioned, and then the, the one um, by the Dallas Theological Seminary guy. And also, uh, Jamie and I both really liked the movie based off of Lee Strobel's life, Case for Christ, because this was super encouraging. 
if you are married to a prodigal or somebody who is unsaved, because that was their case where she was saved several years before he was, and he was very antagonistic to the gospel. So in this case, he wasn't a prodigal, he was just an atheist from the start. But it was encouraging to see her prayer life through that, and also just the discouragement that a marriage does go through. And they actually both, I think it's Lee and Leslie, they have a book that they've co-written recently about encouragement if you're married to an unbeliever or a prodigal and how to pray for that person. So I'm, I just wanted to throw that out there as well, recognizing that, yeah, sometimes the person that we're begging God to save or bring back things of their spouse, and that's a really hard place to be as well. Mm -hmm. Anything else you wanted to add? No, I just, I think it's very fitting that we have added, you know, for this episode that we have added a new segment to our um, coffee break episodes. We're going to be going through prayers for the unsaved, which I mentioned before, which are 30 different prayers for the unsaved people in your life. And we're encouraging you to pick three to five just to keep the numbers small. And, you know, if you have 20 people on your list, maybe during this time, just to focus on those three to five that, that you go into prayerfully asking God to put on your heart to pray for. Um, and obviously, you know, wayward children would be at the top of that list for anyone who has experienced that. Um, and so Joy had asked how to pray for wayward children. And then these 30 days of prayer go through 30 different topics. And it ranges from like today we're talking about for God to lift the veil of deception from their eyes that they would see clearly. There are things surround them with people in their lives that will lead them to God. Um, put scripture in their hands. You know, they're just, they're all different facets of how to pray and um, and it's free. So just go to um, prayingchristianwomen.com slash unsaved and you will get all 30 of those areas that you can be praying for the, the unsaved people in your life. So I'm going to just read this written prayer and you can just pray along with us. Lord, thank you for the love you have for my friend. I know that you are powerful and mighty. I know that you are strong enough to remove the veil that has kept them in darkness for so long. Please open my friend's eyes so that they will know the light of your glory. Remove the blinders so they can clearly see how perfect, holy, and loving you are. Free them from their spiritual blindness, Lord, just like you did for Bartimaeus and so many others. Today I confess that without you removing this veil, my friend could never be saved. So have mercy, gracious Father. Have mercy and free my friend from their blindness. May the eyes of their heart be opened so they can see and know how great you are, how willing you are to forgive, and how worthy you are of all of our worship. Amen. Amen. So again, if you have questions that you think could make for a good coffee break discussion on one of our coffee break episodes, please submit those to us at prayingchristianwomen.com slash questions. We would love to hear from you. And we're going to end with a closing prayer for joy and just for anyone that is struggling with um, people they care about having fallen away from their faith. God, we just thank you so much for joy, just for bringing up this topic that all of us can relate to in some way or another, having loved ones that have fallen away from their faith or who don't believe. Um, we just lift up joy to you today, God. I pray that you would give her hope. I pray that you would give her scripture and just encouragement along the way um, as she waits. Father, I pray that you would transform her, that she would um, just in any way, if, if she has fear or doubt, that you would just replace that, God, with love and peace and just belief, God, that you are powerful enough to do anything, that you are powerful enough to raise the dead and you are powerful enough to raise the spiritually dead. And we just lift up her children that she's praying for, God, and we just ask that you would be with them now, God, that you would lift that veil from their eyes, that you would lift any deception that the enemy would place around them, God, that they would see clearly. And we just pray that you would surround them with people that would just constantly remind them of who you are um, and that they would feel your presence like they never have before, God. Um, and we just lift up anyone else, God, that, um, that is out there struggling with having people that they care about um, who've fallen away from you, God. We just pray you would give them wisdom to know how to intervene in the lives of their friends, um, when to speak, when to pray, when to remain silent, and, and more than anything, God, that you would help us all to trust you and just know that you are sovereign and you are good. In Jesus' name, amen.